God bless everybody today. Thanks, Angel, for having me on Rumble. It's extremely important, I believe, to look at some of these concepts that we're talking about, that we've been presenting to the audience here, um, to talk about them in more depth, to add connections to the conversation, and in hope that we can understand just exactly where we are in time. Um, I've been studying Bible eschatology most of my life, um, approximately 50 years. Um, I found Jesus at five, um, and I left the church um, at 13. Um, I'm not really part of any organized uh, religious group or church or anything like that. I pretty much have been um, walking my own path for a long, long time. Um, I've just come out in the last five years due to things I've seen in current events in eschatology that seem to be affecting us. Um, as we're moving forward into the future, and especially in the last six months or so, things are starting to ramp up. So Angel wanted me to come out and show you some of these concepts. Um, show you the connections in especially the main prophets, which um, Bible prophecy is one third um, of the book. Some, has, um, some of these prophecies have been fulfilled, and some of these prophecies haven't been fulfilled. Since I've been an analyst most of my life, I've worked for institutions, um, colleges, banks, uh, municipalities. I've run my own business for over 20 years. Um, my main emphasis is hardcore line code. Um, I grew up back in the day when we built database systems for the first time in like Turbo Pascal in the 1980s, early 1980s. And so when I look at the Bible, I look at books, I look at any kind of literature or anything like that, um, I look for patterns um, because when I look at things, I'm analytically going through them and trying to determine, especially when you're working with a program, um, you know, I'm a core programmer, so it's my job to build the programs that then allow you to manipulate the system to create whatever it is you're trying to do, but somebody has to build those core programs. Um, even the programs that you use today um, are basically built by a core programmer, and then you use that program to build your new programs or your sub -proof programs or routines or whatever you're doing out there today, but that you're not building the core program, you're using those programs. And so as a core programmer, we go through lines and lines and lines of code. Um, if there's a mistake, it's our job to try to figure out logically where that mistake is, fix that mistake, and then get it back online as quick as possible so that we have less disruption within the system and so the business or institution or whatever can continue to work without um, any delay uh, or as little delay as possible. In this first session, I believe that we need to look at Daniel 8. Daniel 8, I believe, is the key to understanding where we are in time. Daniel's book is made up of 12 chapters, and so I believe you break these 12 chapters down in the proper method. Um, you can line the connections up, and you can see where we are in time. And I think once, you, once we lay this out, and we show it to you on the charts and things that we have to show you, I think you'll make your own connections. Now, I don't want you to take my ideas and concepts and not go out and do your own homework because I'm just, you know, I'm just a man like the rest of you. I'm trying to present these concepts as I found them. Angel felt that there was value in what I had to present. And so that's why I'm out here presenting them to you. And these concepts are unusual in that they are main street or mainlined in any church or religion and they're my concepts or my ideas that i've come up with over the last 45 to 50 years um, and once i came out and started to warn people about the things i was seeing i realized 
that what I believed didn't really seem to agree or have an understanding of anything else that anyone else was saying out here. Um, because I guess I've been so isolated in my own little world in the um, Bible, and I really don't utilize other people's um, video, text, or information uh, for 45 years. I basically came up with my own conclusion, and then in the last five years, I've come out and tried to match them up with other people's conclusions, and they don't seem to match up with pretty much anybody's conclusions that I can find. So Angel wanted me to present these um, concepts to you. I believe that what we're seeing right now is a Daniel 8 prophecy that is going to come uh, complete within the next uh, six months to uh, a year. Um, I believe, personally, there's a PowerPoint in September of this year, at the end of uh, September, around the Feast of Trumpets, uh, Yom Kippur, and the Feast of Tabernacles in September of this uh, year of 2022. And this will greatly affect the uh, country of Iran as we move forward. So let's get into that teaching. So I think it's extremely important that we start in the charts. We show you what we found, and we don't want to um, we want to cut through everything and try to make it extremely um, precise and clean, show you the connections so that anyone can understand them. And I believe with the charts and stuff that I'm producing, uh, you'll be able to do that. So this will make logical sense. And if you have any feedback or any questions, please let us know. So let's get into the, the um, topic right now. How does Daniel 8 affect us today? And how might that affect us in the next 6 months to 12 months? So the book of Daniel is comprised of 12 chapters. And if we break this down, I believe we can see where we are in time today. Um, actually, I believe we're in Daniel 8 at this very moment. So um, that should give you some idea in the 12 chapters where we are in that book itself. Um, we're in the 8th chapter, I believe, right now. Um, this event is starting to build in front of us. And so we wanted to go through this and show you how these connections form why we're seeing Daniel 8 actually possibly occur, and how you can determine whether or not this is actually happening in front of us. So as an analyst and a programmer, um, as one of my trades, um, I build flow charts. And so one of the things that we have to do is when we're putting any type of program together or building anything for an institution, organization, or whatever, we have to build our flow chart so we can get a logical understanding of the procession of events and so that we can start the program, make it work through the continuation of the program to the end, and so that it tests out, it works properly, it can then be um, basic package and then presented to the institution or the organization or the municipality that we're giving that um, program to so that they can then do whatever they're going to do um, with that program itself. So on this flow chart, we're going to mainly concentrate on the upper half. Um, so you can see um, the full chart which takes you through all 12 chapters of Daniel and all the different connections. But we basically want to con be concerned about where we are in time and what's happening around us at this very moment so we can prepare for the second half of the story here. So let's get into this story. I'm going to take you to a, a PDF so that we can look at this a little easier. Um, this is done in Adobe Illustrator, and then I have to move it to a PDF so we can um, manipulate the screen so that you can actually read it because there's it's so detailed that um, it distorts it over time so we have to make it into a PDF so you can actually look at it. So let's look at that PDF and let's start into this and show you these connections up to Daniel 8. So if we bring the PDF up, you've noticed that I've broken this column over here down in chapters 
um, which actually wraps around the bottom. But um, realize that this is the 12 chapters. Each one are broken down so you can see where the chapters occur. And then they're going to show you connections that lead you into everything from Nebuchadnezzar's statue dream to the dream Daniel has in 7 that relates to the statue and all the other chapters in Daniel. And how that shows us a footprint of where we are in the past compared to where we might be in the future or what's happening to us actually right at this very moment. And from that footprint, we can then see potentially the next event that's going to occur as we move towards the beast system or the beast kingdom, which is comprised of Antichrist um, at the very end. And so let's go into this original uh, first set of chapters. So in chapter one, and we're going to going to do a little bit of a summary here because I don't want to get too into a number of these things without you being able to see what we're talking about. So if I summarize the first few chapters until we get down into chapter four, which basically starts to really show the connections um, that we're trying to show you how all these things line up and so god is pure logic i've said this for a while um god is pure logic if you want to try to understand him then you need to be able to look at pure logic and see how he's laid it out so it's like a program um, we have to deal with logic or the program breaks and it doesn't work and so it's so one of our goals is to connect all these dots make sure that there's no syntax errors or any problems in the program so that when you get to the end you get a finished product and that it doesn't break in the middle of all of it so i summarize a few of these chapters we'll go into detail in other chapters but some of them are quite um, as important to understanding where we are in time not that they're not important but they're not a main portion or part of understanding where we are in time at this very moment. So in chapter 1 of Daniel, Daniel and three of his companions are taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar from Jerusalem to Babylon to be trained in Babylonian wisdom. And so because they had been schooled and showed promise, um, they were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon, or to Babylon. They were trained by the Babylonians to understand their ways and their customs. But they had enough education that they could bring value to Nebuchadnezzar. And so they were kept alive and um, were used um, as wise men for Nebuchadnezzar himself. Once we get into chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that um, none of his magicians, soothsayers, or um, people of prophecy could interpret, or um, actually Nebuchadnezzar asked them to explain the dream to him and also interpret it. And they indicated that no one could do that in the kingdom or on the the, in the land or that they knew of and it was brought to Nebuchadnezzar's attention that there was a person named Daniel that came from Jerusalem that was in captivity that he had a God that could show truth and wisdom and that he could possibly interpret the dream and so I've done a breakdown of this statue and the kingdoms of the Jews that they went through throughout history because that's what is important here is we need to understand the history of the Jews and we need to understand the people or the empires that they fell under throughout time. So in Daniel, in the dream of the statue in chapter 2, we have a clear distinction of where we are when Daniel's on the ground because he indicates that in the dream that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold in the statue. 
And so if we look at this statue, you realize that you have the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which is Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. You have the Neo-Persian or the Medo-Persian Empire, which was Darius and Cyrus. And then you have the Greco-Macedonia Empire, which was Alexander the Great. And then once Alexander the Great fell, you had the Roman Empire and then which were the legs of iron and then once you get into the feet of clay and iron mixed that goes from the roman empire which was moved to constantinople turkey divided into a western and eastern division of the roman empire and that was moved to turkey that was then overtaken by the ottoman empire and it indicates the kingdoms that the Jews have gone through. So the first kingdom was the Egyptian kingdom, then the second kingdom was the Assyrian, then when we get into that third kingdom in the time of history of the Jews, we get into that Neo-Babylonian kingdom or Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And so it's extremely important that you understand the history of the Jews and the kingdoms that the Jews have been under captivity. Once you get into this Neo, this Ottoman Empire, which was the seventh kingdom, you'll realize that there's no other kingdom after that except for what he calls the eighth kingdom or the beast kingdom. And that once this Ottoman Empire was vanquished in World War I, that it didn't really die. It's always been out there, and actually Erdogan of Turkey has been trying to rebring back this Ottoman Empire by 2023, and we're going to go through some of that as we move forward in the material. But realize that when this was vanquished or destroyed during World War I, we have had no other kingdom that have ruled the Jews between the Seventh Kingdom and the eighth kingdom or the beast kingdom coming up and that when the ottoman empire fell in 1923 and the jewish nation was reformed as a restored israel on may 14th of 1948 that between the time the ottomans and today no one has ruled the jews and now they have their own country, they have their own um, nation, um, which was formed on May 14th, of, uh, 1948. And so that's extremely important that we look at these things because they're going to affect us as we move forward into the future, into this fourth beast kingdom. So when we get to chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar has created this golden image and commands all men to worship it. Now, Daniel is not there at the time, and so he hasn't endured this um, test of faith. But um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to do this command of worshiping this golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, and he throws them into a fiery furnace and even though the furnace has been um, pumped up seven times in heat, um, they're not affected by this. And so Nebuchadnezzar proclaims their God to be the true God, that only their God has, you know, would be able to protect these people in the manner that they did. And so this was another showing of faith. And we're going to see this in another chapter um, when Daniel um, has to contend with the lions. Um, but realize that chapter 3 and chapter um, 6 are showing that no matter what circumstances that we're in, that we, if we hold faith to the end, no matter what the consequences, even if, Me, if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had gone into the furnace, they told Nebuchadnezzar that they would still be with their God and they wouldn't give up their faith no matter, even up to death. And so it was important that he shows us these stories to explain to what we have to do 
possibly at the end ourselves, and that is whole faith till the very end, so that we also can gain the reward of being with our Lord Jesus and gaining access to heaven. Now when we get um, down to chapter 4, this is where it starts getting interesting because I believe that this is where we start to see um, these parallels, these um, different connections start to form. And so if you go into chapter 4, this is extremely important because Nebuchadnezzar has a secondary dream. This dream, he shows himself he, sh he sees this huge tree over the land and that it's it's full of abundance that all animals are being fed underneath it it's it's a happy tree and everything's going really good but then in the middle of this uh, dream this tree is basically cut down and there's a stump left there but the stump is nourished and over time that stump replenishes and regrows into a new tree and um, is uh, fixed over time. This is a similar thing when we look at Nebuchadnezzar, because Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 built a golden statue, and he wanted all men to worship him, just as we saw back here in chapter 3. But in this case, Daniel had warned him that a year later, after having this dream, he would fail and through his pride he would fall from grace and then be relifted and re-brought back to status. And so we saw this happen by Nebuchadnezzar proclaiming that all men should worship this golden statue that he had done this himself and that god didn't have any part of this or he didn't proclaim god to have a part of this and so the prophecy came true a year after daniel had warned him nebuchadnezzar had through his pride basically sabotaged himself even though he knew this was going to happen. God's word always happens regardless of whether you know it or not. It's going to happen. You can't control these things. And so Nebuchadnezzar fell and so what happened was he lost, he didn't lose his kingdom. He was removed from his kingdom for seven years. He turned into an animal. He gained the mind of an animal. He gained the heart of an animal. He roamed the land and ate grass like an animal was protected by God the whole time. And basically after seven years, he realized that he had come to full circle, that he, that God was the only God, that no man was above God. And from that, then he was brought back onto his feet. He was given a new mind, a new heart, and then his kingdom was restored. And so we can see that in chapter 7 also. Because once you get into chapter 7, you're going to see imagery that reflects this event. So remember in chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar, through pride, fell from that pride. Crawled around on the ground for seven years like an animal. Then after that seven years, and he realized that he had been prideful, looked to God, asked for forgiveness, repented. He was then restored. His heart was made as a new man. His mind was restored and his kingdom was restored as Daniel's prophecy said it would be in the dream of the tree that it was cut down and then it would re um, be uh, brought back to its full glory um, once uh, Nebuchadnezzar had uh, removed his pride and realized that God was the true and only God. So we can see that in a reflection in Daniel 7 that we'll talk about later in the lion with the eagle's wings in Daniel 7, 4. And so we want to point that out 
now so that it will stick in your mind when we get into chapter 7. So we move into chapter 5. Um, Nebuchadnezzar is no longer king. He's passed on and Belshazzar, his son, is the king at that moment. And Belshazzar has a feast. And during this feast, he asks to have the vessels from God's temple, the drinking vessels and other things removed, brought there. Then they toasted in these vessels to their gods of Babylon. And from this, we saw the writing on the wall from God's hand or from an angel or whoever did the writing itself. And no one could understand the writing. Um, none of the people of wisdom of Babylon could um, interpret what it meant. And so it was told to Belshazzar that a person named Daniel of Jewish descent could see these types of things, could interpret these types of things. And so they brought Daniel into the room and Daniel clearly told Belshazzar that because he had desecrated God's vessels in his temple and had done this through his pride, that he would end his life at that night and that he would lose his kingdom and his line would end also. And so this would end up bad um, for Belshazzar. Um, Daniel was awarded a third of the kingdom due to he could interpret the dream regardless of the outcome. And so he was um, adorned as the third um, in command or the leader, not leader, but the person in charge. And that night, the Medo-Persians, Darius, through Cyrus, came in to the city and killed Belshazzar and took over the city. And so this was the change between the Babylonian, Neo-Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire, which if you go up to the statue, would be the head of gold would be the Babylonian kingdom and the silver arms and shoulders um, and chest would be the Medo-Persians. And then the next one would be the um, Greco-Macedonian, which would be Alexander's, uh, Alexander the Great's um, empire. We're going to get into that as, uh, shortly here. So we get in now on just another note in Belshazzar's fifth chapter, this is an interesting concept because it talks about the bear with one side raised and three ribs in his mouth in Daniel 7. And this is extremely important because if you go from the lion of Nebuchadnezzar to the bear, which would be the Medo-Persian, one side is higher than the other. You have one kingdom that is stronger than the other. And so you have the Medes under the Persians, um, Cyrus overthrew the Medes, and so Darius, or you know, Darius and Cyrus were together, but um, Cyrus was the main influence there. Um, and so it's important that you look at the symbolization. And so this this kingdom of the Medo-Persians would also be represented by the bear with the one side raised and the three ribs in the mouth in Daniel 7, 5. When you get into Daniel 6, this is an extremely important chapter in the sense that Daniel is a confidant for Darius. And Darius looks to him as one of his most important um, things on this planet because he knows Daniel's capacity with God and how he has been able to, to tell the future and all these interpretations of dreams through multiple kings at this point. So Darius understands Daniel's ability but he's Darius's trick to put an edict together which states again that only Darius at a certain time of the day would be honored. 
and that they would worship him and that no other king or god would be worshipped other than Darius for up to a month. And so Daniel, being that he is rigid in his ways, he prays three times to God every day. And so he continues to do this and so he goes against the edict that Darius has put together and Darius did not realize that he was being placed into a situation to where he was going to put Daniel, his most prized possession, into a place of potential um, destruction because the edict indicated that if anyone were to worship anybody but Darius, they would be put to death before morning. Or the, by that night, by that evening, or that day, and so Daniel told Darius that he had to fulfill the edict, that he had no choice, that he would have to be thrown in the lion's den, which was basically the punishment for this um, transgression against Darius and the edict that he put together, and so Darius tried to find a way to get him out of this and couldn't. Um, because once an edict is placed into place, they have no way to, or ability to change the edict. And so Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. He spent the night in the lion's den. He asked for mercy from God, and God protected him throughout the night. And so when Darius came back the next morning, he found Daniel unharmed, and he took the three people that had put this um, trap together for um, Daniel and Darius to remove Daniel from the picture. Um, he placed these three individuals in the lion's den and um, that came their destruction. And so Daniel 6 again is a story of hope and of holding your faith through no matter what trial you might be placed into that it matters that you hold your faith regardless of what might be happening to you or the people around you and that if you do this god will reward you or protect you so this is extremely important so in chapter seven we have a third beast that rises it's a leopard has four wings of a bird four heads and is given dominion and so this represents Alexander the Great. He had a kingdom that basically was uninhibited. It struck like a leopard. It was quick. It had quick victories. It overtook everything that it, that it attacked. It basically did what it wanted. But Alexander, at his height, died from his wounds and disease and that kingdom was fragmented and over time its residue formed into four regions which are indicated by the four heads so we can understand these kingdoms and that they represent these first three beasts represent the head of gold the shoulder and chest of silver and the waist and um, the uh, waist and belly of bronze and that they represent these three kingdoms but we also know that if we go into the kingdoms themselves we can see the footprints so if we look at these three kingdoms the neo-babylonian empire and we can understand the footprint that it had. We can see the Medo-Persian Empire and the footprint it had. And you can look at the Greco-Macedonian Empire and you can look at that footprint. And you realize that all these footprints are basically the same. That they really don't encompass up in Russia or in the communist areas. They basically are Turkey, Greece, the Middle East and Port of Na uh, North Africa. So when you get into the fourth last kingdom, which is comprised of these three kingdom footprints above, 
which I show you on these maps here, these are the areas that we should be looking at now. And when you look at Daniel 8, it indicates something important that reflects something that happened in the past. So this ram that has one horn that's higher than the other is a reflection of the bear with one side raised higher than the other and three ribs in its mouth. This is important because we are talking about, again, the Medo-Persian Empire, which is what's starting to form at this very moment. We're starting to watch the Kurds being genocided by Turkey and that they're probably going to have no choice but to join Iran. And when this occurs, we would see a goat crush them. This goat would be Turkey or Erdogan, and that he's in the process of genociding the Kurds at this very moment. He just unleashed multiple new fronts on them within the last month or so and that he's going to re-establish a larger buffer zone between Turkey, Iraq, and Syria because he's concerned about the terrorist group or a group he's considering a terrorist group called the Kurds. And the Kurds, if you go back in history, are the Medes. And so it's extremely important that we should be watching the Medes and whether or not they're going to be forced to join Iran as we move forward in the next six months or maybe a year. And this is important because we are now watching Russia working with the United States to try to get oil from Iran if the United States removes the Revolutionary Guard from the terrorist list while Iran has already probably formed enough material to create a nuclear weapon, that Iran is in the process of completing this nuclear weapon, that Iran has made a designation that they would like to destroy Israel, and that this is going to be a problem if Iran does get a nuclear weapon as we move forward. On the other side of the equation, we have Israel now forming an allegiance with Egypt and another alliance with Turkey, and that they are trying to figure out how to keep Iran from getting a bomb. Turkey's main concern is the Temple Mount that this is the most holiest place on the planet, that they don't want this nuked by Iran, and so I believe that Turkey will be forced, one way or the other, to stop Iran from getting a bomb, that they we will start to see a genociding of the Kurds down through Syria and Iraq. They'll start to move southeast to Baghdad or Shush in, or in the Shush Iran area as the prophecy indicates in Daniel 8 1 to 10 with an interpretation in Daniel 8 20 of who these nations are and that when we see Iran and the Kurds align or join because the Kurds have nowhere to go and most of the Kurdish um, most of the western regions of Iran are Kurdistan groups of people, and so Iran is going to be put into an extremely hard place to try to figure out how to stop um, the Kurds from getting genocide, and they're going to have to bring them in. And when this happens, it indicates clearly that Turkey would then, or the goat, would come over and crush them. And so it's extremely important. If you look at past, history, this has somewhat occurred already, and we're moving into this last season at this very moment. 
So in the past, we saw Daniel 7, 4 as the lion. We saw Daniel 7, 5 as the bear. We saw Daniel 7, 6 as the leopard. But these three kingdoms will affect us in the future and have already. Saddam Hussein would have been the first kingdom to fall, which would have been Iraq. We will see Iran fall next. Um, and it's interesting that now Iran is in their fourth kingdom since, or king since Erdogan has been in power since 2002. And there's a prophecy about this in Daniel 11, which we'll talk about. And that the next kingdom, or the leopard, because this is the lion, this is the bear, and this is the leopard. This kingdom would come up next after Iran is crushed. And so Erdogan, once they destroy Iran, after the Kurds join Iran, we will see that destruction of these two nations by Turkey. And so I think that's extremely important. So from this chart, it's extremely important that we get a breakdown of why all these things matter. So you have the statue that reflects these three chapters in the book, which reflect these three kings or kingdoms in the future of Daniel, which is in Daniel 7, which show us the footprint of these kingdoms. And that when you get to Daniel 8, you would see a Medo, Persian Empire destroyed by Turkey, which would be the same area that Alexander the Great came from, which was Greece, moved to Constantinople, Turkey, divided into two kingdoms, and then destroyed by the Roman Empire, which was the next kingdom of the Iron Legs. So um, Alexander's the kingdom would be the Bronze. And from that, we would then start to form into a future war that is going to come in Daniel 8 from these footprints of the past. And if you realize that if you go back into the seventh kingdom of the iron feet and clay, of, or the iron and clay of the feet that are mixed together, you realize that that is the Ottoman Empire, which we indicated on that chart that I showed you in the beginning, which was that seventh kingdom, and that was vanquished in World War I. So if you come back down, you realize that we're working potentially back into a new Neo-Ottoman Empire rebirth. Because what's going to happen is, Erdogan, as he genocides those Kurds, and if they join Iran, and I don't have a crystal ball to know whether this is going to happen. This is what the Bible says is going to happen, and this is showing you the connection of where we're heading to in Daniel that reflects into all the other prophets and all the other people that give you prophecy that show you what's coming up at the end from Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, um, there's so many of them out here um, that we need to be looking at. Isaiah, um, there's just Joel. All these prophets were telling us exactly the same thing. And if we can lay them over each other, we can then start to see what's coming in the future. So if we're into chapter 6, we move into chapter 7 of those three kingdoms that turn into a fourth kingdom or a beast kingdom, which is the Antichrist system. He shows you the footprint of the other three kingdoms that they're comprised of, that these three kingdoms would then coalesce into a beast kingdom or fourth kingdom, that it would show you a footprint design, that this has nothing to do with communism, and that this from this Muslim footprint of the new Ottoman neo Ottoman Empire that is being reformed by Erdogan by 2023, which is what he wants to do because it was the old Ottoman Empire was destroyed back in World War I in 1923. And so Erdogan, in his wisdom, is in the process right now of trying to rebuild this neo 
Ottoman Empire before 2023. And I put this small um, piece of text in the middle of here so you can understand that Erdogan's vision that he's released to the public has been stating this since 2010, 2011, that this would coincide with the centennial of the Republic of Turkey in 2023, that he would want to rebuild the new Ottoman Empire within that 100-year period from 1923, or, yeah, 1923 to 2023. So this is just like Putin, who wants to rebuild the old Communist Soviet Union and that footprint. Erdogan wants to rebuild the old Ottoman footprint of the past. And that footprint can be easily seen in this footprint here, which is made up of these three kingdoms of the past. The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and Alexander the Great, and the Greco-Macedonian Empire, that this would form into a new empire at the end called the Ottoman Empire or the Neo-Ottoman Empire, a new Ottoman Empire that would end up being destroyed and turned into a fourth beast kingdom. But this fourth beast kingdom is represented by the eighth kingdom down here. And we can see this through the transition of Daniel into Revelation. So Daniel clearly says in the latter time, we're going to see this rise of Antichrist or the little horn. But he indicates something extremely important here, I think, that most people don't get um, when they break this down in, in the proper manner. So Daniel 7.24 says this, And ten kings out of this kingdom, or ten horns out of this kingdom, are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And so this is extremely important. So ten kings rise first and fall, and then another one rises after them, it will be diverse from the first, and it will subdue three kings. So you're saying, well, that's a little confusing. And in some regards, it is. So but what he's basically saying is, Daniel is telling us that ten kings rise first. After them, or their destruction, a residue of four regions or new kingdoms will rise from this. Um, destruction of the original ten kingdoms um, up here. So ten horns start out, they are destroyed, a residue is formed from the ten kings, four regions pop up, and from that a little horn comes out, overthrows the other three kingdoms, and we get a beast kingdom. And so this is representative of what happened back in Alexander's time. So you're looking from past to future. Because if you look at Alexander's time, he overtook all this area, and then he was just, he died at an early age. This area was fragmented and turned into four regions. So look at the fragmentation as 10 regions or kingdoms that then ended up forming into four regions that was basically his four generals consolidated these areas and turned it into four regions. In the future, God tells us that these four regions would reform once these three kingdoms have been overthrown. And from these three kingdoms and their destruction, we would see a fourth kingdom rise diversified from all these other three kingdoms above, it would be the same footprint, and it would absorb all these into one kingdom at the end. So I show this in this part of the chart, the ten regions, or these ten nations, that will form in the Neo-Ottoman Empire that is coming up 
Um, once danioid occurs and Iran falls, we will start to then see Ezekiel 38 and 39 form. Ten nations will end up in Israel by the time we're done. And they'll be destroyed. From that destruction, a residue forms. Four regions come up or new kingdoms come up from that. And from one of those regions, a little horn, and then he overthrows three other re the other three regions, and then it becomes a diversified peace kingdom, or the fourth kingdom. So we can see that because the lion, which is Iraq, the bear, which is Iran, and Turkey, which is the leopard, um, I think I took backwards, I should change that, um, work into the beast kingdom or the footprint of the beast kingdom. And if you go over to the statue, that would then represent the breakdown or destruction of the Ottoman Empire. Or the new Neo-Ottoman Empire that's forming. Because this was destroyed in World War I. We see a new forming of a new kingdom by 2023 through Turkey. And the radical Muslim ten nations that will join him on their way to Egypt and Israel and that when they are destroyed by the wrath of the Lamb in 616 Revelation 616 by the wrath of the Lamb all ten nations will be destroyed we would then see this residue form four regions would appear a little horn would come forth and then overthrow the other three regions and this would then convert into a for a um, fourth beast kingdom or in the history of the Jews would be the eighth kingdom um, or the last kingdom that the Jews would be under until the Lord Jesus comes back at the end. So the important thing to take away from this conversation, and I want to end this now because we're getting into almost 45 minutes and um, we don't want to get into the end of the story because we're concentrating on what's happening in front of us at this very moment. What's happening in front of us at this very moment, the thing that we need to be watching is chapter 8 of Daniel. It clearly indicates that we see the Medes and the Persians, or the Kurds and the Iranians join. That we would see the goat from Turkey or Grecia destroy both these nations. But then the king of Grecia or Turkey is also destroyed. And once that occurs, we would see basically a six seal event when that occurs. So I've been talking for a while that Erdogan is the white horseman of Revelation, that he would then go through the Middle East. We would see Daniel 8 happen first, the destruction of Iran. That first horseman is going to bring the other three next seals forward. Um, core of the world under war, economic collapse, famine, disease, all these different things. You have a fifth um, seal, which are the martyrs, because a quarter of the world is under duress through war. And then on the sixth seal, we would just see the destruction of these nations, these ten nations here. Okay, on the sixth seal, or the wrath of the Lamb. Then, from this destruction, we would see a residue form around Jerusalem and Israel because of this destruction. And four different kingdoms would rise from that residue, similar to what happened in Alexander's time. When Alexander was destroyed, a residue formed, four regions came out of that. Same thing, past the future. And that from these four regions that will form, once they're destroyed by the wrath of the Lamb, at the end of 2023, on my paradigm, and we'll get into the paradigm over time, we would see then a little horn rise. And that would bring forth Antichrist. This footprint that we should be watching in real time today 
is Iraq, Iran, and Turkey, and that we need to be watching this footprint of the old Ottoman Empire. That if we look at this Ottoman Empire, and we go through here and realize that this is the quarter of the world that's going to be under war and under duress, and this is the catalyst that's going to bring everything else out, um, we need to have our optic on this event called Daniel 8 at this very moment, at least in my opinion. And so will the Kurds be genocided to the point where they have to align with Iran or Persia? And when this happens, it clearly indicates that a goat or a leader from Turkey would come over and crush them, but then he would be broken and that four kingdoms would stand up out of that nation, but we would see basically an antichrist form from that destruction um, as we move forward. So hopefully this helps explain and break down this uh, mapping. I think it's extremely important that when you go through this chart, you realize that the statue reflects the animals. The statue of chapter 2 reflects the animals of chapter 7. But then once you get into Daniel 8, we start to reflect the past footprints that we need to watch in the future so we can determine what's going to happen next. And that is that the Kurds are going to join Iran. And we're going to see destruction of Iran and the Kurdish nation by Turkey by the end of this year. At least that's in my opinion. God bless everybody. Have a great night. And we'll talk about the rest of this chart as we move forward. Um, I may be wrong. I don't have a crystal ball. I can tell you what the prophets are telling me based on the analysis of all the different prophets and how you break this book down. And that if you follow these different paths, we're going to start to see something happen in front of us that we are actually going to start to see potentially the destruction of a nation called Iran. This geopolitically will change everything. Fuel prices, food prices, everything will go through the roof. So be prepared, put some oil in your lamp. Find the open door. That's Jesus. Um, he's the only way to get to the heaven and to the Creator. God bless everybody. Have a great night.